uh, the both the panel and the breakout session that I was in, I say were fabulous. So I hope people are learning and talking. We had good conversation. And right now I am going to um, introduce our uh, keynote speaker. I'm going to read his bio, his slashed bio. Uh, and then I'm gonna say a couple of other things. But Xavier McElrathby is a champion for the human rights of incarcerated children and he is known around the country for continually professing no child is born bad. Through his work as a senior advisor and national advocate of the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, Xavier fights to abolish life without parole for children in America, and in recent years, he played a role in ending this practice in several states, including Nevada, Utah, Arkansas, South Dakota, and North Dakota, and those are tough states. He is also, he is also a co-founder and proud member of the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network, an initiative of uh, the Fair Sentencing for Youth, which seeks to amplify the stories and voices of leaders who were incarcerated as youth. In his powerful TED Talk, No Child is Born Bad, Xavier reminds all of us that no child should ever receive a death in prison sentence and that all children, including those who have made horrible mistakes, have the capacity for positive change. So that's his bio. Now here's what I have to add. Xavier is one of the people that I've known him for over 20 years. Um, he is one of the people that has kept my enthusiasm in this work always present. He is one of the people that has, when I am really like, I don't know why I do this, makes me want to do it more and never forget why I do it. He has been an inspiration and a positive force in my, in my life. I consider him my son-in-law. <laughs> uh, and he is just an extraordinary and marvelous human being, Xavier McElrathby. I love that son-in-law, right? It's beautiful. Um, I just want to thank you, Hershella, and others who made this possible. You know, you know, you, 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 you know. I've been to many symposiums, many experiences where you hear about you know, adolescent brain development, you know, the sort of emergence of you know, developmental neuroscience into the space of juvenile justice. And it's interesting because I, I think going into that experience that I've heard it before. And, but I also, I'm repeatedly reminded that there's so many layers to this that you can never learn enough. And I have to be honest with you, there was a point um, during the presentation, I had to step out for a moment. I had to go out here and get some air. Um, and to be honest, it was, a little, it was a little triggering for me. But while out there, I just had to sort of, you know, really just think through some of what I heard and just try to reposition my thoughts. I want to be here present and available for you all to share as best as possible. But I remember walking out there and I saw the water. I'm like, and I stepped on it. I'm like, this is quite shallow. Like, and I remember stepping out a little bit more, and, and, and I remembered a quote that my cousin had put on Facebook. Emmanuel put a quote on there. It said, he said, the quote said, people will see you walk on water and say it's because you can't swim. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, I, and I thought about it like how cool it would be for me to get a picture out there on the water <laughs> and to put that quote on Facebook, like it'll blow up. You know, I'll go viral. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to have her show, like, join me on that one. So. But yeah, I just, I just have to say that, yeah, I, I've learned so much just being in here for these past couple hours. And, and for me, you know, it's, it's really also um, a sort of homecoming in my own thoughts 
about why this work is so important. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, usually I would, I would try to frame this in a way that I would want to surprise, but you know, I, I want to, I want to put it out there immediately. You know, when I met Hershala, Hershala, and you know, and I, and I, and I respect that she always allows me to share this. Um, she's also very sensitive to, and, and to my, you know, to my mind state and how I feel, and never impresses upon me to share this. But I want to share this out, out front. When I met Herschel, it was in 1989. At the time, I was a 13-year-old gang member who had 19 arrests and seven convictions. I was a child who had repeated stints in juvenile detention and solitary confinement. I came from a horrendous childhood, one that was marked with abuse and neglect, one that was looking back at, even at the age of 13, I could look back upon the age of 11 when I was shot in my face at point blank range, looking back upon the abuse of a foster care system, repeatedly beaten by the police. In fact, when I met her, I was still recovering from my wounds of being beaten into a confession. So understand, when I met her, Shell, it wasn't under happy circumstances. And I remember I was sitting in a TV room, I was in the audio home, I had just been sent to the adult section on, uh, on 4E. There was four sections. And I was in the middle section for the smaller kids. At the time, I was probably about 110 pounds, probably 5'1", five, 5'2", five, very visibly a child. And so they put me with the smaller kids. And I remember on a day she arrived, I was sitting in the TV room, and I was sitting on the softest seat directly in front of the TV. Now, if you're in the audio home, you get the soft seat, you came up. Like, otherwise, you'd be sitting on that back seat, on that hard seat, trying to you know, move your legs around, try to release a little tension, but the reality is that on this day, I was sitting there and I remember the staff yelling, Xavier, you have a visitor. And understand the TV room, the way it's situated, there's a glass, there's a small partition that divides the TV room from the day room, which is really just a, just a constellation of chairs and tables where we usually, we usually eat and play cards. And I looked out and above and I couldn't see anyone. And I remember going around the glass, when I looked around the glass, I looked towards the bubble, a small desk space there, and I saw her shell standing there. And when I saw her, I didn't recognize her, and I was like, maybe it's a mistake. I don't, I don't even know who she is, first of all. And I remember them calling me to, the, to that small desk, and they said, Xavier, you two should take it to the back. Because the place wasn't, wasn't made to accommodate a private conversation. If you all have been in the audio home, you know it's just a long space, and you have a TV room, day room. You have a small space where the kitchen, where, where you have the milk and, and the sink. Well, along the back are three cells of solitary confinement, and then there's a bathroom. Well, I sat in between the bathroom and solitary confinement, and while we were sitting there, I still didn't know who she was. And she said, hi, my, my name is Herschella. And I don't know exactly what the introductory words were, how we met each other, but I came to understand that she was my new public defender. The previous public defender that I had in, juvenile, in a juvenile court beneath um, I knew very briefly. In fact, I often knew my probation officer, my, my uh, public defenders, very briefly. And so my expectations were not very high. I didn't know who she was. I didn't have much expectation around what that engagement would look like. But I remember that conversation being much different from what I had ever experienced with any other, pro any other public defender. Some of the questions that she asked me were not about, just about my case. Some of the questions that she asked me were about my personal life. I remember her asking me, you know, how I was doing. I remember Hershella asking me, when was the last time I had a visit? I remember Hershella asking me, what was my core experience like? Am I okay? Where am I in my mind state? How am I dealing with the environment? Are, you, are they treating you well? And these are conversations that I was not used to hearing from a public defender. And I remember thinking to myself, what that would look like in that engagement in the courtroom. Understand, and one thing we talked about earlier, the judges already sit very high. And I'm like, my public defenders would be short as hell in this courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm damn near taller than her. Like, you know, <laughs> this is not a promising situation. And I remember thinking to myself, like, you know, she seemed like a very caring woman, but understand at that point, I had 19 arrests and seven convictions. I had been in out the system all my life. You have to understand, for me as a child at that very young age, every adult to me posed a threat. And I did not get that sensation from Hershella. And I remember 
departing from that reality and having to engage with adults who were not so caring. And so for two years, I was in a juvenile detention center. And while there, I was exposed to even more harm, more trauma. I remember the, the tendency of the officers, the staff, we didn't call them officers, they would literally block off a certain section of the TV room and they would have someone standing at the front glass to peer straight towards the main elevator. They'll have someone at the other end of that, uh, of that section looking in the other direction. And when they would do that, they would allow us to wrap our hands with towels. And we called it a ticket. You can request a ticket. If I have a problem with somebody, I say, man, I want a ticket with him. I'll tell the staff, and they'll be, okay, we'll set it up tonight. To them, it was entertainment. To us, it was a beef. All over, and the sort of atmospheric pressures that we had, really, was just, it was really just negative peer pressure. And I remember we would, we, would, we would just go at it right there in the TV room. I remember if you were fortunate enough to get visits every week, you might be able to create a rapport with the staff. You might be able to become buddy-buddy with them, and they would bring you cigarettes and alcohol. Your mom would sneak you $10, $15, and they would go across the street to a liquor store and buy these items and bring them back. And it created a system of favoritism because these individuals were profiting off these kids. A little petty cash to take home, a little gas money to get to and from. Understand, for us, though, sadly, it was really just a manifestation of the traumas that we had, that many of us were already contending with addiction. Many of us were already contending with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, 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 a propensity for violence, not out of anger and hate, but out of a sense of principle, because that's what we were told we were supposed to do. In fact, the very first time when I was in the Audi home, it wasn't because I had harmed someone. In fact, to talk about the, the abuse of a system and adults that, that didn't regard me as a child, I remember at the very young age of 11 years old, me and my friend were told where the, where the guns were. They said, one of the older guys said, man, look, if you have any problems, the guns are underneath the back porch on, on troop. And we knew exactly what house that was. And I remember when we would go, we would look out of curiosity, but we would never just take it out immediately. But then on this day, we were brave enough to take them out. I remember slipping a black, old, wet, rusty bag out from underneath the porch. And I remember us looking inside, and we saw a sawed-off shotgun. I was 11 years old. My best friend, Ivan, was 13 years old. My other friend, Tony, was 12. So we were not far in age. Another friend, I forgot how old he was, but we were all in the same age. Range. And I remember reaching in and grabbing and moving the shotgun to the side. It was quite intimidating. But then I remember seeing this small, actually, I would say long for a revolver. It was so shiny. It, was, it, looked, it looked pretty much new. It looked like you all ever seen Yosemite Sam, the one the ones you spin, the, the old Western gun. Well, it looked like that. And I remember pulling it out, and I was just amazed. I was intrigued by it. And my friend also, we started playing with it. And we're like, yeah, this is the one. This is the one, as kids, having that association to that cartoon, having that less sense of threat, made us this increasingly more exposed to harm because we thought that gun was safe in our hands. And I remember we, we put it inside of a smaller bag and we started walking around the neighborhood with it. But we didn't get far. We, in fact, we had hit the, the, the first alley and we were playing with it. And I remember my friend got very hyper with it and was playing and click, click, boom. The gun went off and when the gun went off, Instantly, I knew I was shot. The, bu the bullet at, at, this, at this range had entered beneath my left eye. So if you all see the little dimple right there, it's not a dimple, it's a gunshot. And the bullet entered and traveled through my sinus and it lodged behind my left ear. And I remember instantly being knocked into darkness. And, and when I had warped in and back out of slow motion and darkness, I realized that my face was burning, extremely burning sensation was coming, and I felt blood rushing out of my mouth rushing out of my nose, going down the back of my throat, and I just thought I was going to die. My best friend panicked. He dropped the gun, and I remember him grabbing me. And when he grabbed me, my other friend grabbed me. And I remember instantly him saying, I just skint you, I just skint you. He wanted to believe that he had just skint me. But I felt the, 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 the the, the, the pain resonating throughout my whole face. And then instantly I felt my, the left side of my face had become numb. And I couldn't touch, I couldn't feel anything any longer. And I remember he, they had pulled me into the gangway into my best, another friend's house, Pito's house. And while there, when I came in, as the blood's 
you know, coming out of my face, his mother panicked, screamed, and said, what are, who shot you? And I remember her talking in Spanish, saying something along the lines of pinche gangueros, I tell you to stay away, your kids are not listening, and look what happens to you. So she didn't know how to respond to that. And I remember going to the bathroom, and while they're holding me up, my friend said, I skint you, I skint you, and he grabbed the towel, and they wiped my face, and the fountain of blood continued to pour out. I understand, this happened within seconds. All of this happened. I, couldn't, I didn't have a chance to really even, really even process what was happening to me in a moment. But I, I, remember, I remember saying, God, why me? I remember saying, God, why me? And I, I knew for certain I was going to die. And while in that, in that state, I remember hearing the ambulances come. The, uh, Pito's mom had called the ambulance. And when they came through the gangway, they came and they grabbed me. And they put me in this gurney. And I remember saying that I could not lay all the way down. Because if I laid all the way down, I would choke on my blood. So they kept me elevated. And while they're pushing me in, all the kids and, and people and neighbors, and, and, of, of the, they were all surrounded. Like, man, speedy shot. It was hysteria. And I didn't have, like, once again, I didn't have a chance to think about it. But I knew to some degree that the police would be involved, obviously. I'm a victim of a gunshot. And while they're in the ambulance, we hadn't even taken off. They're, they're, they're sticking, sticking needles in my arms. They're checking my, my, my reflexes. They're, they're asking me to follow their finger. They're asking me, do I know what, what year it is, what time it is? And they're like, there's any sense of cognition. They wanted to see how coherent I was. I was responding. They felt OK with that. The police came into the back of the ambulance. They stood over me. And the only question they had for me was this, who shot you? And I understand the police to me are a threat. I understand to me the police are the enemy. As, a, as an 11-year-old child, I had already came to conclude that the police was an alien force that would invade my community and beat my ass, along with all my friends. They were not, my, they were not our friends. And when they asked me who shot you, I knew in my heart that I was not going to tell them my best friend. And I just made up the quickest story I could think of. I said it was a, it was a man in a black car. And I remember them rushing out the ambulance, and they went like basically pulling over every car. My friends were like, man, the neighborhood was hysterical. The police were everywhere. They were flying in every direction. I didn't witness none of that. But I also remember finding out later that night that one of the friends that was, that was also there, had, had been, he did tell the truth. Because in his mind, it was an accident. Nothing wrong. It was nothing intentional happened. In his mind, my friend shot my other friend by accident. That's it. And that should be understood. But no. In, in, in the course of that conversation, the police decided to charge my best friend with attempted murder, pending perhaps murder charges, because they had 24 hours that hadn't even passed yet. And I remember the police coming to the hospital, and they walked in. They said, why did you lie to us? I'm like, what? I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, you lied to us. And I just went silent. I didn't say a single word. I put my head down, and I just closed my eyes. And they got tired of trying to engage me, and they walked out and said, we'll see you again. And I remember that same experience while in the hospital. They came back once more. And I don't remember what that interaction was, but little did I know that they were already beefing up charges against me, an 11-year-old gunshot victim, a kid who had already had prior arrests for minor trespassing, for minor stealing a candy bar. At age nine, I stole a candy bar from a grocery store and got caught. Instead of going to my home to witness the poverty and, and the hunger, they decided to arrest me and have my mom to go through a station adjustment where they lectured her, scared me straight in their mind, and sent us along, sent us our way. Sadly, all those things were held against me. And the points had racked up to a point now where I could be considered for detention. And even two weeks after my gunshot, two weeks after, I'm still recovering physically. I still have lockjaw. Something happened chemically, biologically in my face that when I was shot, my jaw locked. I couldn't talk. I could barely open my mouth to eat a sandwich, to barely even eat a peanut butter jelly sandwich. I could barely even, and my hearing was still coming back on my left eye. To this very day, I have 2200 vision. If I close my right eye, you all, I, I really can't focus on anyone. It's like a television screen with dead pixels in the middle. But when both are open, one overlaps the other. And I don't sense the inadequacy there. But the reality is that in some ways, I am legally blind on my left eye. Back then, I saw what looked like a chicken head jumping up and down inside my vision. 
a, I'll never forget a, a, a dark orange chicken head that would jump. I don't see it anymore. But I was still visually re recovering. I remember the police pulling up on 40, 48th and Racine, half a block away from where I was living. While walking, they pulled up on the side of me and they said, they said Speedy. And I stopped and I looked at them. Now at the time, I still have a bandage on my face. They said, hop in the car. I was like, what? And the one officer in the front said, you heard what the fuck I said? And he jumped out, and I was like, I'm getting in the car. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to argue and fight with these people. And I remember getting in the car, and he said, guess what, Speedy? I'm like, what? He said, you're getting locked up. I'm like, for what? What I do now? I ain't do nothing. He said, you're being charged with obstruction of justice. Obstruction of justice. And of course, an 11-year-old child doesn't know what obstruction of justice even means. And so I remember being taken to the Audi home later on that night, my friend Ivan still contending with, with, with attempted murder charges. Somehow, some way, they thought it would be convenient to throw this 11-year-old gunshot victim in the Audi home and keep him there, you know, with the idea of him not being able to miss that court date of his friend who's being charged with his attempted murder. And so I went into the detention center for the very first time, physically vulnerable, partially blind, still recovering, unable to eat. And I remember the nurses downstairs making all these assessments. And when I went to, finally, I went to the intake section, I sat there. And I have to say, this probably was the worst 24 hours of my life, to be honest with you. Even worse than being shot, to be honest with you. Because I remember when I went to intake, I was on section 3J, I would never forget, and I sat down. Once again, interesting enough, I went for that soft seat. No one was there. All the kids were still in the school. And I anticipated, in my mind, I was preparing for myself for what was to come, all the stories I had heard about being locked up. I had already spent the night in, 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 in the police station and being processed and made it, making it to intake while the kids are gone. I didn't know what to expect. And when they finally started to come into section, they started shuffling into different places. Some went to the bathroom, some went over to the milk machine, some were talking to the staff, some were allowed back into their cells to, gra to grab things. Me, I was just sitting there watching intently, analyzing, searching gang tattoos, trying to see who my allies were, trying to see who my enemies were. Sadly, that's all I could think about. And I remember in an instant, without even notice, some kid was standing over me and he said, get the fuck out of my seat. I was like, what? He said, get up out of my seat, homie. You, you're, you're in my seat. And of course, it was the best seat in the, t in, in the TV room. And in, my, in that moment, I didn't have much time to think. I understand I'm still physically vulnerable. But I will never forget what one of the older gang members told me. He said, Speedy, if you ever get locked up and someone try to disrespect you or take something from you, don't say nothing, just swing. Just swing. And for me, in my mind, I, ha I had no choice. And that's exactly what I did. And I jumped up, and I swung with all my might, and I hit him, boom. My eyes are closed, to be honest with you. <laughs> I was scared. And when I opened my eyes, he was still there. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> this kid beat the living daylights out of me. Like, bing, boom, boom, knocked me into the TV. I fell. The staff came and with almost instant swipes. And they just separated us very easily and grabbed me and threw me into solitary confinement and threw him into that cell. And I understand that the moment I'm in there, I'm breathing hard. My heart's pounding. I'm looking in the mirror, examining my injuries, seeing what, what, what else went wrong. Am I OK? Did they reopen my, my scar? Like, I'm just thinking about physical, you know, self-preservation, am I okay? I'm not thinking about the consequences. I did what I had to do, but I, 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 and I got my butt whooped, but I knew in my mind that I did what I had to do. And I remember the staff going back there, slipping a piece of paper underneath my door. It was like a green or pink slip. It was like a fluores some fluorescent color, and I looked at it, and it said, fighting. And it said, X, it was an X by three days. And it said, counselor. And I didn't know what that meant. And I'm thinking, in my experience as a child, whenever I did something wrong, they would stop the situation, you go back to normal daily activity, whether that's in the school, whether that's in the foster care system, or even, even in, in other academies and places I have been placed all my life. The, 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 as soon as you stop, you can immediately resume daily routine. Well, that wasn't happening here. Suddenly, I'm standing by the door waiting to come out. And I'm looking, I have a bunk, I have a, a big giant window to the back, I have a toilet connected to the sink, a very dim, dingy mirror, and I'm pacing, I'm waiting to come out. And I remember the staff going back there, 
and feeding me and bringing me the food. And I said, man, when can I get out? He said, you're not going to get out. He said, you got to wait for your hearing. I said, like, what do you mean a hearing? And he explained to me that I had three days before, before the hearing. He was telling me that as a child, an 11-year-old child, I'll be locked in this small cell for three days straight without interaction, without any human contact, without any type of counseling or therapy. A nurse came that night and looked at my wounds to re-examine if I was okay, if I could just simply bear with what I was going through. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I can't do this. It was excruciating, mentally and emotionally excruciating. And then I remember I started hearing a noise in my cell, and it sounded like this. And I was like, what the fuck? Am I hearing stuff? Like, what the hell's going on? And then I heard it again. Doom, 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 doom. And I walked to the back of the cell. And I understand in the audio, there's this long slab of steel that lines the back of all the cells that go around the building. It's like, I don't know what year it was made, but if you hit one part of the wall, it'll echo throughout the section. I just thought maybe they're down there messing around. I heard it again, doom, 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 doom. And I remember stepping to the back of the cell and I put my ear to the wall and I heard even more loudly and I realized that, that the cell, next, the next cell over, where this kid was at, the one who beat me up, was banging on my wall. And I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> like, now, like we're, we're about to gang bang through these walls. We're about to come, we're about to go hand back here because I'm not going to be a punk. In my mind, I'm like, what? All along, I'm like, still scared of this guy. I'm like, what? He said, man, he said, look down. I said, what? He said, look down. And I looked down, and he said, do you see a hole? And sure enough, he was right. And I looked down, and I noticed that the mortar between the bricks had been worked on. Parts of the brick had been chipped away. And he knew, and I understood, just by the basic structure of this place, that that one brick is what separated us, just that one brick. And he said, man, you work on that side, and I'll work on my side, and we'll knock this fucking brick out of here. We'll get it out. Let's get it out. I was like, let's do it. And we didn't talk about the fight. Like, we didn't talk about it. And I remember I had a pen or a toothbrush. I forgot what it was. I was just going at it for a long time. I'm sweating, and we're listening now. Suddenly, we're so, like, intuitive about what's happening outside of the cell. I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, the staff is coming. The staff's coming. Stop. And we knew the sound of the keys that meant someone was coming. And I remember eventually we were able to successfully get that, those pieces out. I remember busting that brick on the floor and he, him doing the same on the other side, breaking it up, and all you hear is the toys. And I remember one of the kids, who I didn't even know, him running back there, and he slid some cards underneath my cell door. He was like, I didn't realize what was happening. Like, what the hell's going on? Like, what's going on? These cards are coming in. And I'm like, I'm taking these, though, because I know how to play cards, you know? And I didn't know who, I didn't know who this kid was. And I, and, and I wanted to this day, is it because that was tradition that we knew to look out for each other no matter what, to provide some relief to each other? Or was it because he, he, was, he respected me for standing up to that damn bully next door? You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know what it was, but we had those cards, and I remember we eventually started playing cards with each other through that little small hole. We never talked about that fight. It's very interesting to me because I look back and I realize that that situation was so excruciating. I'm talking about God makes your enemy your friends, but well, that cell makes your enemies your friends too. I'm going to keep it real with you. And for us in that space, that was the only relief that we had, the only human interaction that we had. Eventually, we did come out. And unlike many of the kids probably expected, they probably thought we would go to war with each other, but the reality is we were like best friends after that happened. And to me, in my mind, what that meant more than anything is that every, cow, every child just needs that, that, the, the human touch in their life. Sadly, we had to find it amongst ourselves. No one really saw it within us and reinforced it, but sadly, we had to discover it from time to time, even with those who we thought were our enemies. And that was a part of my disillusionment. When I was sent to the adult system, being faced with extreme consequences, I didn't fully understand what it meant to be try, tried as an adult. I had no idea what that meant. And I remember the very first time when they finally decided to send me into the adult system, I was already at a place where I had accepted it. The sad reality is that when I was given a 25-year sentence, it wasn't, it, it, the, the, the judge actually felt that it was a, it was a, a, a mercy call and for a child, it was hard to interpret that. But my public defender, Herschella Conyers, 
and I both knew that it truly was a mercy call. I'm going to go back to my experience there in the courtroom when the judge basically gave a continuance in my case. And the state had offered a 40-year sentence. Understand, my co-defendant, who was 14 years old, who only had one prior arrest and one prior conviction, had just received 40 years in prison. We were charged with first-degree murder. At 13 years old, I was charged with first-degree murder. And the sad reality is that witnessing him go into the, to the system with a 40-year sentence, it wasn't something that I had heard from a staff or from a guard or even from anyone. In fact, when, when the night that I heard about his, his guilt, it's the night that I sat in my cell and I sat there and I watched towards that same elevator at about 10.30 at night and I remember looking down the hall through the glass and I told myself, when he comes back from court, he's gonna have to come off that elevator. When he comes out of that elevator, I'm gonna take that slight, slight, slight moment to see his facial expression. If he walks out of that elevator crying, it's because he got found guilty. If he walks off that elevator with a smile or even looking remotely normal, it's because things might be okay. And I remember waiting and waiting and waiting. I had left the courtroom, went back to the audio mob, obviously. He stayed longer for his trial. And I remember standing by and waiting and getting restless and pacing, going back, looking, making sure I didn't miss it, because I couldn't sleep until I knew his outcome. And I remember when I heard the elevators open and he stepped off and there was two staff on the side of him and he was crying. And in that moment, I... <clears throat> in that moment, I started to cry. Because <clears throat> I understood that if he had one prior arrest and one conviction and they didn't have no mercy on him, they're not going to have mercy on me. I had 19 arrests and seven convictions. I, was, I played a more dominant role in the offense. In fact, when they had arrested me on a Friday night for that charge, they found three guns in my house. They found a 410, a 12, they found a, four, a 410, a 38, and another weapon. I forgot what it was, but they found three guns in my house. One was hid in the bottom of a laundry basket because my friend panicked and he tried to get rid of it. But when they arrested me, understand, they came with the notion that I was, that I was guilty of murder. They also came with the notion that I was dangerous. And when I went to that courtroom, even more so, they had depicted me as a monster. In fact, I remember the state's attorney saying, the defendant has an extensive juvenile arrest record indicative of a violent nature, meaning I would never change. This kid is naturally violent. This is before they started calling us super predators. The language was that this person has, has a, a, a juvenile arrest record indicative of a violent nature. And when I saw my co-defendant come off the elevator, I just knew that there's no way, there's no way. And I, I, I honestly was tormented with the thought of what I had been a part of in the first place. And I knew in my heart that I was not gonna ever go to trial. I didn't ever wanna go to trial. I, I was guilty as charged and I wanted to plead guilty, but I was following, I was following what I thought would be the best approach and with the guidance of Urshela to let's, let's not make that move. So let's not make that rash decision. Let's wait it out. Let's fight this. And I remember going to Urshela and I remember saying that I'm, I'm willing to plead guilty. And, and we talked about what that meant. We talked about what it meant to, for you know, the, the mandatory minimum of 20 years. And the fact that my co-defendant who just received 40 was less culpable. And for me in my mind, I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna go to trial because they're gonna slam me on my head. I'll get 60 years. And I fought that and it hurt Herschella to have that conversation. But I was more than willing to seek and find something less than that. And I remember us going to the courthouse I mean, me going to the courthouse and talking to Urshela, she said, Xavier, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to fight, I'm going to do the best I possibly can. They had arranged for a conference, a meeting between the state's attorney, the judge, and herself. And I remember being in the bullpen waiting, what felt like for many, many hours. I remember I was pacing, and I remember the smell of feces and sweat, 
And I remember the dirty toilet. I remember examining the bricks and tracing the dots. I remember trying to distract myself, but being exceedingly anxious. I was sweating. I was scared. My heart was pounding. It was no relent. It was constant fear. And I remember about two or three hours later, she came back to the bullpen. And she came back to the bullpen, and she was crying. And when she walked to the bullpen, she said, Xavier, I'm sorry. I said, for what? What's going on? Like in my mind, like something horribly wrong happened. She said, I'm sorry, Xavier. I was only able to talk them down to 25 years. Understand, I was faced with 40 or more. And so me and my underdeveloped brain, I'm like, what you crying for? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you know, like, it's 40, 25. <laughs> Shit, ain't hard for me to figure out. I'm blessed, you know. But in her mind, in her shellless mind, and we're like, and I truly, and under, truly understand and respect so much now, even more so is that she saw me as her child. You don't want to see your child going, spending a 25-year sentence. You don't want that, you know. And, and for, for her to have fought so hard for me, her stern advocacy and fight on my behalf, honestly, really saved me. And even when I didn't realize it, we talk about working with youth in the system. We think this kid doesn't even appreciate all that we do. And it's not that I had that response, but in my mind, I, I need to understand for me still at, the, at that very young age of 15 now, two years later, I'm still immersed in gang life. I'm still heavily fighting solitary confinement even more so now. I, I have no sense of a future, but I remember when I, when, when I received my time, I remember getting very emotional, and I remember her, her shoulder saying, do you want to talk with your mom? Now understand something, we had a pretty rough judge. The state was even worse. And the moment that her shoulder said, your honor, is it okay if my client can, can, can meet with his mother in the back, we'll make sure it goes well. You know, his mother's here, and it's a very sensitive time, we want to make sure. And so she was thinking about what would I want for, if that was my kid, I would want to talk to my kid right now. And, 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 and I'm sure she understood what it meant to me. And the state says, Your Honor, um, I object. That's not, you know, it's not you know, what we do, blah, blah. You know, in so many words, you know, Xavier, you know, is a threat, blah, blah. Like, and so they pretty much didn't want me to even have that most meaningful opportunity to talk to my mom. And her shelter fought that, and the judge gave in and said, Okay, we'll give you 15 minutes. And I remember my mother coming back there, and my sister was standing on the side of her, and they stood at the bars and they held them. And I remember looking down, I was crying, my mother was crying. And I remember looking at my mom, and I'm going to tell you something. I just told her a bold-faced lie. I said, Mom, I promise you, I promise you I'm going to stay out of trouble. I promise you I'm going to go to school and get a college degree. I promise you I'm, I'm, I'm going to get out of here and do something better with my life. And I was just trying to make her feel better. I was just lying to her. <laughs> but it's interesting because that was a time in my life, obviously, when I had at least the inclination to understand what sounded like the right thing to do. Slowly, with the impressions of love and compassion from Rochelle and others, I started to get a sense that perhaps there is something better out there, that perhaps I'm not a monster after all. And wanting to satisfy my mother in that moment to take away and relieve that pain, I spoke a truth without speaking, without realizing I was speaking a truth. Little did I know that as I grew and matured in the system, my brain would evolve. Little did I know that when I was in Pontiac Correctional Center several years later, in solitary confinement for a year by myself for assaulting a correctional officer, that I would have a moment of reflection and maturation, that I would have a moment of remorse, a change in my life, not because of solitary confinement, but because of the evolving brain, the realization that, ow, oh, this hurts the realization that what I did was so wrong, the realization that there are people out there who really care about me, and I keep squandering my future and my life, and that death row is just 300 feet away from me. So for me, at that time in my life, when I made those promises, I didn't realize it, but the truth of the matter is that because of the hope and promise that Herschella planted, that seed that was made possible, with the understanding of a provision that would give me a day-for-day -day good time, allow me to walk free in my mid-20s, that all those seemed light years away was a real goal to strive towards. Though that I understand that, that I would have an opportunity to come out. I ended up serving 13 years in prison. 
When I came out, I had an Associate of Arts, an Associate in, in, uh, associates in General Education, I had a bachelor's degree in social science, had a 4.0 GPA, was inducted into the Franklin Honor Society for Outstanding Scholarship. I came out two years later, I got my master's degree from Roosevelt University. I wish I came here, but I love you, Roosevelt. <laughs> you know. But I, I just have to say that my life did change. And it was not because of the system, it was, it was in spite of the system. It was a reality that I was never truly a monster that I was really a kid who came from a horrendous childhood, who really should have never been given up on in the first place. But sadly, that was my fate, but not my destiny long term, in the sense that I was able to come out and recreate my life. And today, I'm raising a soon-to-be eight-year-old girl. So, And most excitingly, and what she inspires within me, is a very strong belief that no child is born bad. And so I fight today alongside many others who are just like me and who have been in, in the system, who have lived through the, the, the manifestations of trauma, uncaring systems, and unforgiving courts. But we stand now strong, united in, in our desire to help reform the system. And that entity, that organization, is the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, which spearheads an initiative called I Can. And ICANN is the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network. Today we have over 100 plus members in 27 states. Our criteria, now don't, don't, don't trip out on this, but our criteria of membership is you have to have been convicted of a homicide related offense as a child. None of you qualify, so let me make that clear. But I say that to say that we are looking at individuals and leaders who've been through it, and who can really represent and stand as ambassadors for those who are inside the system. The, re the legislative reforms that you heard about earlier in Arkansas, North Dakota, and South Dakota, and just recently in the District of Columbia, these are reforms that are made possible directly by directly impacted leaders, individuals who are able to come out because of a second chance to help speak on the behalf of those they left behind. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a magical science to it all. When I joined the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, I remember passing the Constitution when I took my GED, but I never knew what legislative advocacy would look like. I remember the first day of training when I had joined the campaign, they had me watch this video. You know that song, this is a bill, this is a bill, like, you, know, you know that video? Well, that was my initial, my, the initial formation of my thoughts around what it means to, to, to help create legislative reform. And then next thing you know, I found myself in Nevada, standing there with, with, with our policy team, sharing my story learning about how laws are created and, and how, how we can help change them, how there's hope. Interesting enough, in, in my most rude awakening, I came and discovered that red states were leading the way. I'm like, what? Help me understand that. The majority of our bill sponsors were conservative, Republicans, out of red states. Help me understand that. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that, and I'm still learning as we go along. But I share all this to say that Every little child that you encounter in that system, trust me, is no different from me. I'm really just, mere, just a mere reflection of all the potential that exists within these systems, and kids in particular who, believe it or not, have extreme resilience to intervene at that time of a, a, a very impressionable time of their lives. I call it a black hole. Between 11 and 17 is a black hole, y'all. And what I mean by that is that that is a time when a child is extremely exposed to making poor decisions. We talk about the developmental neuroscience, that the divide between developmental neuroscience and legal policy, interesting enough, has, has decreased. However, there's so much more work that needs to be done. And I realize that we are, those who are formerly incarcerated are in a critical space of help pushing that along. With the support of those in this room, I know we can make a big difference. And we talk about you know, what it looks like for a child to go into the adult system and how to sort of soften those experiences. I want you to know, point blank, no child should be sent to the adult system at all. Let's get our thoughts out of that. Number two, no child should ever be sentenced to life without parole. It is cruel and unusual. And that 30, 40, 50, 60 nonsense is just nothing but a de facto life sentence. Let's get away from that. Let's fight for our kids as if they're our very own. Let's never lose sight of that potential, the plasticity of their brain and recognizing that there's great and ample, ample opportunity to make a difference in that space, that you can live a life 
driven with purpose and meaning when you know that that kid someday may stand up here and call you out and say you're a wonderful human being. I love y'all. Thank you.